today I'm not going to talk about programming paradigms, although I could say a lot if I wanted to. Today I'm going to talk about building distributed systems and about a programming pattern that we found, which is really nice. And it started in a project called SelfMan, European project that I was coordinating a few years ago. I have a project now called Lightcone, but this is not about Lightcone. So, so the idea is that big systems are very complicated. Everybody knows that. It's very obvious. And since some years, people have been trying to make systems self-managing. So something like in autonomic computing. And the idea is you want to use feedback loops. It's very obvious. But one feedback loop is very easy. But how do you combine many feedback loops? So this is a kind of pattern that we found. So we call it a feedback structure. And I'm going to introduce it through lots of examples, biological systems, computer systems that work, which are good examples. And we'll see the pattern. And then I'll talk about a bigger system, which we developed in Selfman called Scalaris, which is a, a large uh, self-managing uh, transactional uh, database, the key value store, and how it's based on five of these feedback structures interacting. And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about intelligent behavior, because that's a big thing now with deep learning. And then I'll, I'll uh, say, where are we going with this? So we want to build robust distributed systems. So let me define, first of all, so systems, the notion of a system is just a set of components that are connected together and they make a coherent whole. So there's a very general theory of building systems, which started actually with uh, Norbert Wiener's work on cybernetics in 1948. Very nice book, which I recommend, by the way. So a distributed system is a special case of a system a set of computing nodes connected by network that appears to its users as a single coherent system. That's one way you can define it. And there's a very famous um, initiative starting in 2001 called Autonomic Computing, probably everybody knows, by IBM, by means of a loop called a MAPE loop, Monitor, Analyze, Plan, Execute, to system, simplify simple system management. So very nice loop. But one loop is, is very few. Systems need many loops. So how do we combine feedback loops? So that's what I want to talk about. So first, let me say just a little bit about the loops. So a feedback loop, so this is my primitive element, a very simple thing. So I have a subsystem, which could be any kind of system. It's monitored by a monitoring agent. It has some agent that calculates a corrective action to take, and an actuator, actuating agent that does things, okay? And this is all, these are all concurrent components sending messages, so it's very similar to uh, the Erlang style process communication. So this is a very natural kind of a structure. And the subsystem can itself be hierarchical, okay? So feedback loops are actually everywhere. The more you look, the more you find them. Here's a simple example where I have a human user using a, 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 a GUI where they have a keyboard and a mouse and the application and the display. And this is a f feedback loop, okay? And then many other things are feedback loop. Uh, garbage collection is a feedback loop. The monitor waits until there's not enough free memory. It initiates the garbage collection, which then actuates, which then runs the garbage collection. So it basically interacts with the system. And there's many, many, many other feedback loops. So, but I'm not gonna stick, stay just and talk about feedback loops, okay? I want to say how we go beyond single loops. What, are, what is the natural pattern when you go beyond it? So feedback loops are everywhere. Optimizing systems based on feedback loops is actually very well understood. There's a whole theory, control theory for that. There's a famous, famous book by Hellerstein, uh, control, feedback loop control of computing systems, which is very nice for optimizing one. And at the very end, there's an advanced chapter with two feedback loops, okay? But feedback loops is a very low-level thing. You need very many, and I'll show many, many examples. So the point is, how do you connect them together? And also, how do they relate to the functionality of the system you want to do? So combining them, that's what I want to talk about here. How to combine them and how to connect them to the system specification, the system you want to build. Okay, so that's enough philosophy. Now I'm gonna show lots of examples. There's piles of examples. So here's the first example. This is a hotel lobby example. So here we have a hotel lobby and it has air conditioner. So it has a, 
thermometer, it has a thermostat, and it runs the air conditioning if it gets too warm and so on, you know, it keeps it nice and cool. You have this primitive tribesman, some savage guy who never doesn't know about modern technology, he walks in there, it's kind of cold in there, so he basically says, makes a fire, okay, he stokes a fire in the hob lobby, and uh, so that's the second loop. Feels cold, stokes a fire, okay, and the hotel lobby is the system where these two loops are interacting. So what happens? So this is an unstable situation. It depends on the strength of the air conditioner and the, the strength of the tribesman and the amount of wood he has. So basically, the air conditioner is going to work harder because there's a source of heat. Okay, it's going to work harder. So the tribesman gets colder, so he makes the fire bigger. So it's kind of an unstable situation. Okay, this is a unstable. This example comes from Norbert Wiener's book, actually. It's taken directly from his book on cybernetics. So this is actually, there's a problem with this system, it's unstable. So how would you debug this? How would you debug such a system where you have these two feedback loops? How would you redesign this system so it doesn't have this instability? Well, this is a question that Wiener asks in his book. He leaves the fix as homework for the reader. He doesn't actually give the solution in his book, okay. So, so, uh, so this was an interesting example. So I thought of a solution, and if you think you probably come up with a very similar solution, here's, here's a solution for this problem. That tribesman, instead of stoking a fire, he simply adjusts the thermostat. Huh? There's a nice solution, right? So this is the structure of the new system. So the first loop, the th air conditioning loop is the same, stays the same. But the second loop, instead of interacting with the system, it interacts with the first loop. Okay, you see? So this is actually in the terminology of this uh, kind of design. It's called management, where one loop manages or controls the other. Instead of stigmergy, stigmergy is the term that's used when two processes interact through the environment, which is the hotel lobby. So in this system, stigmergy was unstable. And this management structure is stable. So this is a solution. I'm not sure if it's a solution that Wiener was thinking about, but uh, it's a reasonable solution, except that the tribesman basically has to learn something. Huh? He has to understand that there's this little device on the wall called the thermostat, and he doesn't have to do very much effort. But this actually is a stable solution. So one lesson you could get from this is to use the system. Don't bypass it. So the inner air conditioning loop is a system. Don't try to force it to do something. Don't bypass it, but use it. Okay, so that's a lesson. So that's one example. Okay, so you can see that this kind of a design is, is actually interesting, huh? designing in terms of interacting loops. And actually, TCP is using a similar approach. Now you have an inner loop, so here's a subsystem which is the network. Packets are sent to the network. When the acknowledgement is received, you get an acknowledgement back. So this is only one side of it. Huh? This is the, the transmitting side. And then you have the sliding window winding protocol, which figures out which is the next, byte, next packet to send, and so on. So that's an inner loop. This inner loop is actually controlled by an outer loop, which monitors the system throughput. And it, does, it modest, modifies, the outer loop modifies the inner loop in some way. So there's congestion, huh, for example. And the way it does it is actually very simple. It changes the size of the sliding window. Okay, so TCP is actually a similar approach to the hotel lobby. Okay, so you can see it's kind of interesting to think in terms of feedback loops. Okay, okay, that's one example. Let's do another example. Let me connect this to Erlang's approach to fault tolerance, the supervisor tree. So most of you know it, so I'm not going to go very much in detail. I just want to connect it to the feedback loop approach. So Erlang is a language used for developing extremely reliable software. So you have a set of running processes which have independent memory spaces, and they're basically all concurrent, and they send messages asynchronously. So the fault tolerance is done at different levels. So there's a primitive failure detection by linking, which I'll explain in a minute, 
uh, on top of each of these, on top of these processes, you have supervisor processes and a supervisor tree. So supervisors can be uh, nested in a tree. You also have a stable storage to restore consistent state when there's a crash. So the primitive failure detection, so this is very simple. It's, uh, these are all processes. Processes can be linked. And if two processes here are linked, if one of them fails, the other is terminated. So failure is permanent crash failure. Any kind of a problem is mapped to permanent crash. So this is very good. It simplifies. You don't want to correct uh, corrupted state. You just force the whole system to fail or the subsystem to fail. And the processes have this uh, supervisor bit. If it's zero, we have this behavior. All of them, the linked ones fail. If it's one, so the blue one up there is a supervisor. It doesn't actually fail, but a message is sent to it uh, informing it that the other processes have failed. So this failure is actually monitoring in a feedback loop. And if we go one step farther, so here we have a supervisor tree. So this is the basic beginning of many programming patterns. So there's books, uh, for example, a uh, book by uh, Francesco and Steve Minoski giving you all kinds of programming patterns based on this idea. So each supervisor process observes a set, and there can be and supervisors and or supervisors. And supervisors are observed by root supervisors. And I have a little story about that. When, uh, when Joe Armstrong was doing his PhD in 2003, so eventually he decided to get a PhD, KTH. So I was actually in his thesis jury. So I thought this was very nice. I asked him a question. I said, do you ever go beyond two levels in this tree? He said he couldn't think of an example. I don't know if ever you need to go beyond two levels. But anyway, you have a two-level tree. So each internal node of this tree actually corresponds to one feedback loop. So the supervisor, it monitors, and then it, it, it actually actuates. It does a corrective action when it notices there's a failure. Okay, so that's Erlang. Let me give another example, very different. The subsumption architecture from Brooks, from Rodney Brooks in the 1980s. I don't know if you ever heard of this. This was actually an AI thing. It's actually a very interesting pattern for AI. So a subsumption architecture is a way to implement complex behaviors by decomposing them into simpler behaviors. And one behavior can override the other. So you have a layered system. Okay, a lower layer does something, it can be override, overridden by a, the next layer, and so on. So layers are priorities. When a layer acts, it disables the lower layers, okay? And they interact through stigmergy, so which means that the layers affect the actual system. They, they, each lay, they don't actually communicate directly through each other, but indirectly through the system that they are managing. So that's the theory. Here's an example. This comes from a paper by Rodney Brooks. So here we have a robot. It's actually an interesting algorithm, interesting approach for, control, for the basic control of robots, for the low-level control of robots in an environment. So the basic behavior of this robot is it goes forward. There's a forward decision, goes forward. The second layer is a direction sensor. Every once in a while, maybe it has to turn. Okay, so the turn decision is made. It disables the forward layer and it turns the robot, okay? And the third layer is an obstacle detector. It comes across something and it has to make some kind of avoidance decision. So it disables the two lower layer and it does some kind of avoidance maneuver. Uh, and, while, and when the avoidance maneuver is done, it gets back to going forward. Huh? So it, it, there's something in the way, oh, it walks around and then it keeps going again, okay? So this again is a a system where you have multiple feedback loops and together they manage the behavior. It's very different from the hotel lobby example because here they are, they are actually independent of each other. It's just that they're organized according to priorities, okay? And it's actually a, a, a good way, of, realistic for low level behavior. Huh? So for example, uh, ants or cockroaches would use something similar to this. So that's an example from uh, AI. Now let's go and do a more realistic example. And this example is the human respiratory system. In fact, in, the, in the biological organisms, there's huge numbers of examples. 
And you can find, and I have another example in appendix slides that I won't get to, but you can look at. So the human respiratory system in a, as a set of feedback loops. How does it look like? Well, here it is. So here I have the breathing apparatus in the human body, so the muscles, the lungs, etc. How does this work? There's actually four loops. The default behavior here is a rhythmic breathing reflex. It measures the CO2 in the blood, carbon dioxide. When it gets to a certain level, it triggers the reflex. When the CO2 increases the threshold, breathing reflex, and you breathe. And this is automatic. This is the default behavior of the human respiratory system. Okay? Now, that's normal behavior. Things can go wrong. What if you're eating uh, something and it goes into the wrong direction? It goes into your lung. An obstruction in the airways. Another loop is triggered, this inner loop. It's called laryngospasm. It basically temporarily seals off this, this, uh, the, the connection, the air pipe to the lung so that uh, you can cough or whatever and get rid of the obstacle, okay? But it's temporary. It's basically, it works on different time scales than the actual breathing. It only blocks the thing for a few seconds and then it releases it again, okay? Only on the obstruction in the airways. So, I can uh, reassure you, if you start choking because of something getting in the wrong way and you, you can't breathe, you're choking, don't worry. It's normal. Just wait a few seconds and be able to breathe again, okay? Breathing system was debugged by evolution over billions of years. It's very, very reliable, okay? No problems, okay? In general, there's no problem. So don't worry about that. That works fine. Now, other things can happen that are more complicated. I'm driving a car and somehow I fall into a lake or a canal and the car starts sinking. Well, I don't want to have my breathing reflex work when I'm submersed in water, okay? So there's another component called conscious control. So the third loop takes control. So my brain figures out a very sophisticated planning strategy for me to get out of that car and back onto the shore where there's air. And in the meantime, I suppress my breathing reflex by conscious control. Okay, so that's this conscious control component. So usually, it's not, it's not active. My conscious control is usually doesn't care about breathing, okay? But in certain cases, it can take control. Whenever it decides to take control, it can take control. And all of the massive power of 100 billion neurons will compute my best chance of saving my life, okay? So that component is very, very smart for most people. Okay, so, but it's not infinitely smart. So what, what, still things can go wrong, okay? Now, what happens? So, let's say I'm, uh, I've had uh, too much to drink and someone makes me a bet that I can hold my breath for 15 minutes. So I hold my breath, okay? <laughs> And I'm not going to, I'm going to keep holding my breath until what happens? Until I die or run out of oxygen or whatever? Actually, no. The evolution has taken care of that possibility as well. So what happens? There's actually several things that happen here. There is a, a point of the CO2 threshold called the breath hold break point, so that's a medical term. When this point is reached, the conscious control doesn't work. The reflex overrides the conscious control and you will start breathing even if you don't want to, okay? So when you really, really, you say at some point, uh, some, you, ha you have to breathe. So it overrides it after a certain point. Now a trained athlete can go beyond this and can actually fall unconscious while holding his or her breath. And then the final loop comes into play, which is the failsafe. This one, the outermost loop measures the oxygen in the blood. 
When the oxygen goes too low, well, the brain just sort of stops working normally, okay? So the person falls unconscious. And the conscious control loop basically falls away. And the normal breathing reflex continues, starts up again, okay? So this is kind of a fail-safe. The conscious control, which, it's, which can override the breathing reflex, can itself be overridden by this fail-safe, okay? So this is how it works. So how did I determine this? Actually, I got it from, from Wikipedia, okay? Well, no, there's actually some very good stuff there. There's an entry on drowning, which actually explains the whole structure. I have not seen it in a medical paper, although I think it's a very interesting way to look at this system, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about how the design of this works. So there's four loops, two inner loops, breathing reflex and laryngospasm, a loop controlling the reflex, which is the conscious control, and an outer loop, which is the fail-safe, okay? Holding the breath can have two effects. Either the breath hold threshold is reached first and you breathe no matter what you want, or the oxygen threshold is reached first and you fall unconscious, which causes you to breathe again. So don't worry. Holding your breath as long as you can, it's, there's no danger to your life, okay? No problem. So design rules. So the interesting one is the conscious control block, which is much, much smarter. All the other blocks are very simple. Conscious control is very smart, and I'll talk about that in a minute. This block is very different from the others. It's extremely intelligent, and it's sandwiched between two simpler ones. The breathing reflex gives you abstraction. The conscious control does not have to know how to move every single muscle in your lung, okay? And there's also a protection against instability. The conscious control is very powerful, but because of that power, it may go wacko. Huh? Who knows what the conscious control is going to decide. So there's actually protection against that. That's a powerful problem solver, but you have to hold it in check, which the body does. And you can look at this uh, structure as a state diagram. So each of these states here in this diagram corresponds to a subset of the loops in the feedback structure I just showed you with all those loops. At any given point in time, some of them are active, some of them are not active, inactive, so you have different states. So normal breathing here is the normal case. One loop is active, okay? If you have an obstruction in the airways, you go to normal laryngospasm, where the, the breath control, where the two loops are active, and usually the conscious control can, can uh, notices that, okay, and goes, what's going on here? And also becomes active, so there's usually a transfer to the top one, which is conscious laryngospasm, okay? But eventually it goes back to normal breathing. So this is oh, another way of looking at this feedback structure, okay? So now you kind of see how this, differ, this system, this kind of systems are made. Okay, so now we've seen three or four examples if you count the TCP. So now let's, let's try to infer some kind of a design from this. What do these examples have in common? So they use a combination of feedback loops to maintain a system property. Uh, the desirable hotel, the lobby temperature, fault tolerance for, for airline, efficient communication for TCP, moving while avoiding obstacles for the robot, proper breathing for a human. They're maintaining a global property, okay? So I give a name to this, a, a combination of feedback loops that together maintains one global property. I call this a feedback structure, okay? So we're not thinking in terms of single loops anymore, but in terms of feedback structures. And actually, I have many, many more examples. I'll show you a few more examples, but feedback structures seem to be a natural element when you're building these complex adaptive systems. So if you want to build an architecture, actually, you can see then four steps. The first top one, where you have concurrent components that are sending messages to their neighbors asynchronously. This everybody knows. We have feedback loops, which is the next step. Monitor, corrector, actuators, okay? They're maintaining a, a local goal. A feedback loop maintains a local goal, part of the system, a, a, 
an implementation goal. But then the next one here in uh, violet is the feedback structure. Here, now we're starting to think of the specification. We're maintaining a system property with these loops that are working together. And the loops manage each other, they interact, okay? Each loop is not living by itself. Uh, a loop can dis disable another one, they can interact through stigmergy, so they really are collaborating, uh, these loops. And then if you look at a bigger system, a bigger system usually has to maintain several properties, not just one. So each property is maintained by a feedback structure. And then these feedback structures have some connection to each other. They will have some interaction, a weak interaction, because each feedback structure is using some of the resources in the environment. So by that fact, it will have some effect on the others. But there can also be explicit dependencies where the feedback structure needs the functionality provided by the other one. Okay? So that's uh, a methodology. Now let me talk about a bigger system, a system called Scalaris. Scalaris, which we built in uh, the SelfMed project, which is basically a high-performance transactional self-managing key value store. So this was built mainly by one of the project partners, which is the Zuse Institute in Berlin. And so this is actually coming out of the SelfMed project. So this is in 2008. So uh, you can see the performance here. Nowadays, it's, it's things, performances are a little bit better. But this one actually won a prize, which is unfortunately hard to read. This is a plaque. The IEEE International Scalable Computing Challenge in 2008. So they built a scalable version of Wikipedia, of a Wikipedia backend, and entered it in this context. So they actually won a prize, and it's the Technical Committee on Scalable Computing from IEEE that gave this prize. So this diagram here shows the different layers. There's a peer-to-peer -peer layer, replication layer, a transaction layer. So you can see, so there's a basically a structured overlay network. You have data is replicated and load balanced over there. And then you have transactions using consensus for maintaining strong consistency. And the Wikipedia was built on top of that. So this is one way to look at the system. Okay, this is like a traditional way. You built the system in layers, but with our notion of feedback structure, we can look at the system in a very different way, kind of cross-cutting the layers. So the specification of Scalaris is actually a conjunction of six properties. Uh, so there's one functional property, which is called S key value here, which gives you basically the, the correct behavior of the API and the, the key value operations, read, write, transaction, et cetera. And S Scalaris is the overall specification. But then you have five other ones. S connect is the connectivity between the nodes. S route is the efficient routing. S load is a load balancing algorithm, which communicates to manage the load if there's a hot, a hot point. There's also replica management, making sure that if the node crashes, that instead of four, you have only three replicas. It main recreates the fourth. Uh, and then there's a transaction management which with a transaction manager, which does a, a two-phase commit and a consensus algorithm between the, the replicas. So these five pieces of the specification are each maintained in the system, depending on what happens in the environment. Uh, so connectivity, for example, if a node crashes, it detects that and has to do something. So there's a feedback loop in there doing something. The routing is for efficient routing, so it creates fingers, which show in a minute, so efficient routing, and again, it has to adapt to failed nodes and new nodes joining. The replica management also has to adapt when replicas disappear, and the transaction manager has to do the operations of the transaction, and then there's a load balancing. So there's dependencies between them, so all of them depend on connectivity. If connectivity disappears, they all disappear. But if transaction disappears, the rest still exists, okay? So there's a dependency between the functions. So, so you can do efficient routing, but maybe you don't have replicas anymore. And so there's a this dependency between them. So these five feedback structures are living in the same system. They are, in some sense, designed independently of each other, okay? So this was how the human person, people, the team who designed this, 
They designed them independently, starting from the more primitive ones, connectivity building up to the, the transaction management. And since they're part of the same system, they will interact, but weakly. So you assume that the interaction is going to be weak, okay? The load balancer, for example, will send messages around the system, and it, so it adds itself a load to the system, so, but you assume that it's a weak interaction with the others. So that's your, your, your basic assumption to build the system, that these feedback structures are weakly interacting. So when you build a system like this, the idea is to create a set of feedback structures, one for each global property, and then they're dependent, of course, among each other, and they will be weakly interacting by the very fact that they're part of the same system. Okay, so this is our design approach. So just to give a few details about the low level, so Scalaris is based on a structured overlay network, so this is a very, there's many, many variations of this, and it's still used today, and uh, there's two feedback structures I want to show you here. So the, the blue nodes here are neighbor connectivity. So this is basically managing connectivity, uh, even if nodes fail or new nodes join. Each node knows several neighbors, not just one, but some number of neighbors, so that it can handle a certain number of failures. Uh, today, this could be replaced, for example, by a gossip. Uh, we're using hybrid gossip algorithm in Litecone to do a similar thing to manage connectivity. And then once you have connectivity, you can optimize. So the fingers provide efficient routing, and they're added, so they give you exponential uh, routing in the structured overlay network. And it doesn't really matter if they're temporarily in an inconsistent state, but the feedback structure is always converging towards an optimal state. So this, what I'm showing you here, has two feedback structures. This is just the communication. So I won't, I won't go on and discuss the other ones, the replica and the transaction. Uh, there's a reference, you can look at it if you want. So some performance numbers. So these are from 2008, okay? So don't compare them with 2017, but for those days it was not bad, okay? Throughput operations per second, number of nodes, scales up pretty well, okay? The, the, the nodes managed to keep their work pretty much independent of each other, okay? So we scaled up to 32, actually for the Wikipedia, up to several hundred nodes in those days. Right? So that's uh, Scalaris. And that's an example, of a, a bigger example of this design idea. Let me now, before finishing, say a few things about the actual components in these feedback structures. So the, the weekly interacting feedback structure approach, so it's a framework. You design the feedback structures depending on each of the global properties, okay? And a subset of the structure will be active at any time. But you still have to design the components themselves. The, the, it doesn't solve all the problems, it's just the, 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 the top level structure of your system. And sometimes you need intelligence, you need smartness in there. And the framework itself does not provide intelligence, okay? It provides adaptiveness, resilience, but it itself doesn't provide intelligence. If you want intelligence, you have to put in what I call smart components. Some of the components in some of the feedback structures have to be smart, and the conscious control in the human respiratory system is an example of a smart component, okay? So how do I define a smart component? Well, a smart component is a component that completely solves a problem in a small part of the system operating space, but only in that part. So for example, a deep learning algorithm can be extremely smart when detecting uh, images of birds. I saw an application where it tells you what is the species of bird. But if you show it something else, like a cat, it has no idea what you're doing, okay? Outside of the space, they're very stupid. So they have to be managed by the rest of the system by the rest of the feedback structure, okay? So smart components fit very naturally in this kind of a structure, and you really need them. So here's a picture of a powerful machine, a Porsche Carrera GT. Why is it powerful? Well, because it has a 3.6 liter bi-turbo motor with 353 kilowatts, 480 horsepower inside there. That's why it's powerful. 
There's no other reason. So if you want your system to be powerful, you have to put in the smart components, okay? So the feedback structure will not solve all the problems. It just gives you an over a structure, uh, like conscious control. Scalaris uses uniform consensus. You know, Paxos Raft does heavy lifting. And sometimes you need that heavy lifting, and the, you cannot get around it. There's no other way. You need an algorithm which has the power of Paxos if you're building a large distributed system, okay? Uh, AlphaGo uses deep learning and Monte Carlo tree search to beat the world champion Go champion. Google search, this is an old one from the 90s. It calculates eigenvectors of the web link matrix. This is a fairly complex calculation because the web link matrix has several billion on the side. So my question then to you, when you build a system, what is your smart component, okay? You want your system to be smart, you have to put it in. So there's many kinds of smart components. And intelligence is not one thing. So the Turing test is kind of irrelevant for this. Intelligence is many, many pieces. Uh, human intelligence is one, is, is the strength of human intelligence is that it's adaptive. Humans are always creating new, new feedback loops. We've got millions of them stuck in our brains. But uh, a recent one here is deep learning algorithms. It's, in my view, deep learning is like a tsunami. It's coming, you have to do it. You have to have deep learning components in your system. Uh, but other components are also smart. A compiler is a smart component that we know very well. It's able to translate a human readable program into an efficient execution. That's pretty smart, okay? Especially since programming languages are not simple things. And many libraries distill some kind of intelligence, huh? like consensus. So smartness is in the eye of the beholder, and smart components are things that we, can, we add to our systems. Okay, let me conclude. Now you've got sort of an idea. So it's hard to design big systems. So the idea is we look at existing systems. Biological systems are very nice because evolution has debugged them over a long time. Not perfect, but they're pretty good uh, in the real world. Huh? Living organisms do a pretty good job. And, and this design pattern, this kind of a pattern kept kind of coming back. Because we were very unsatisfied with the, the autonomic computing initiative huh? because they talk about single feedback loops. That doesn't help very much. It solves one small problem in your system. We want to build systems. So we found this way of organizing it. So the feedback loops are basically working together. So you have weakly interacting feedback structures. And if you want smartness, you add complex or smart components where you need, OK? So this kind of a design approach, so this was started in the Selfman project. We are still working on large scale distributed computing. It's actually not really a solved problem yet. Huh? As most people know, there's still a lot of unsolved things there. We're working on edge computing. And edge computing on the internet edge is very interesting because the edge is a very hostile environment. It's very dynamic. The phones like to be offline. There's low power. Networks are not very reliable. So we want to do stuff there. Also, we start noticing the smart components. Somehow deep learning is, uh, is coming. Uh, you could say winter is coming or deep learning is coming, okay? Also, we're doing large scale evaluation. We really want to scale things up. Okay, so that's all I want to say. I hope you think it's an interesting pattern, that feedback structure, it's an interesting way of structuring large systems and uh, that it'll help you make systems that are more robust. So thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Any questions? Yes, question. Uh, what, do you, what do you think we've learned since Norbert Wiener's book? Oh, we learned a lot of things. Although Wiener was very smart. The book has some very interesting things. But uh, Wiener did not really have a good idea of overall system structure. He was able to look at, he was basically a mathematician. He, he, he knew how to optimize things like uh, regulation, feedback loop, and so on. He didn't really know how to have any general way of combining things. But it's part of a more general thing. So in uh, computer science, uh, there's like a golden decade from 64 to 74. Most of ideas 
were coming in, uh, like uh, closures, lazy execution was in there, logic programming, relational database, etc. But not distributed systems. Distributed systems came in much later. It started in the only really in the 80s when Lamport, uh, Lamport clocks and Paxos and so on, which was like around 1990. And, and it was a mess until the early 2000s. If you look at distributed system textbooks in the 1990s, like there's this book by Gerard Tell from 94, it's just a bunch of things. There's no general principle. If you want general principles, you have to wait until Nancy Lynch's book or uh, Rashid Garoui and Luis Rodriguez's from 2006, 2007, where everything is very carefully structured in terms of layers, in terms of what is the, the, the system model, what kind of partial synchrony are you using. So, so I think to answer very briefly, we learned a lot. Wiener only basically recognized the problem, okay? He didn't have any general solution, but he has a very good nose for recognizing the problem. He has a very good intuition. So it's actually still worth reading that book, yeah? Hi, uh, thanks. Um, so you, you present this pattern, the idea of feedback loop and feedback structure. Do we have, a, so we have this, the book from Cybernetics, and do we have a more recent book that would propose some uh, pattern, pattern or structure with the good ideas and you, you should probably not choose in terms That's of That's a very good question. Only? There's not that much. Actually, there's some references. There's references here, but some of them are better than others. So, so there's a, there's a, a, res a report, there's this one you can read, which basically explains what I just said. But there's an interesting book by Peter Senge and his colleagues from 94, which is basically a library of feedback structures, but in terms of human organizations. So if you look at the title, it looks like the, one of these generic no content management books, huh? But don't be, don't be deceived, it's really, really good. So I would recommend, it has a library of several dozen of these, and it explains how you avoid problems like tragedy of the commons and many other kinds of uh, global system problems. Uh, so other things are, I had a master student here have a survey. So here you have several dozen systems that are surveyed, but still there's no real general theory or general book. Uh, the, there are bits and pieces. We're still waiting for like a textbook. Uh, um, that's all questions we have time for. Thank you very much, Peter. You're welcome.